And to discuss it with, we have Alberto Cole, professor De at DePaul University. Sir, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. All right, Alberto, thanks uh, for being with us. Now, I, I want to start with this, um, I guess it's a million dollar or a trillion dollar question here, uh, potentially, if Mr. Trump returns to the White House and this idea of potentially he's saying he'll fix the war and the war in a day. I mean, is, is that plausible? I mean, do you, do you think that's really his, his stance or is this just uh, more electioneering? So, um, you know, I think Donald Trump uh, is famous or infamous for saying all kinds of things. Uh, he has a very big mouth. He likes to talk off the cuff, likes to say outrageous things, things that come to his mind. Uh, so I would think that in the campaign over the next few months, we're gonna hear a lot of really outrageous, uh, boastful, uh, all kinds of off the wall comments from Donald Trump. It, it's almost as if he likes to think aloud, but while he's thinking aloud, he puts these things out verbally. Um, and I would really not take any of this seriously. I, I know it's hard to do that because we're used to having political candidates who think very carefully about what they want to do before they say it in public. That's not Donald Trump. OK, so we're going to hear a lot of things from him. I'd say don't pay attention to them. And if he wins the election, uh, then we'll just have to pay very close attention to the kinds of advisors he names, who he puts in charge of the State Department, the Defense Department, and then the kind of policy that the United States actually follows. Now, but also on the other hand, we have Antony Blinken, who says that Ukraine will join in NATO. And we also know, know that it will not happen anytime soon. I mean, NATO is not going to take in a new member while conflict is happening in their country. And also it is an interest um, in um, Putin's interest to just prolong this war for as long as he can. And I'm sure, you know, Russia can do it for longer than Ukraine. Where do you see this going in the long term? Um you know, very sadly, I, I, I know that uh, the United States and Europe have given considerable aid to Ukraine so far, but the aid that we have given Ukraine has always come, for the most part, a little too late. And uh, we have talked about all kinds of capabilities to the Ukrainians at one point. For example, very early in the war, the idea was put forth that we should give Ukraine F-16s. Well, it took the United States over a year to approve sending F-16s to Ukraine. And now we're training the pilots. So the, the F-16s will not arrive in Ukraine until the middle of the summer. Uh, same thing with the ATACMs. These are the long range uh, missile systems that Ukraine has been asking for since right after the war started. Well, it took a year for the United States to decide whether to give the Ukraine ATACMs. And when we did give them to them, we did not give them the longest range ATACMs, nor did we give them the shell that actually has a very uh, concentrated impact. Mm -hmm. So the capabilities we have been given to Ukraine obviously have helped Ukraine stave off massive disaster, but they've also come a little too few and a little too late. And that's one of the reasons we are where we are right now. At this point, Ukraine is facing an existential crisis. And uh, part of the problem is, too, that the United States and Europe allowed their defense industrial base to deteriorate for three decades. We were very illusory thinking that peace was a permanent feature of international politics, that Russia had evolved permanently. And now we're finding that even when we want to give Ukraine equipment, a lot of the equipment still cannot be produced in sufficient quantities or fast enough to give it to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So we have all these problems to address. Uh, and uh, right now, I would say that it's going to be a very close call whether Ukraine can survive a major Russian offensive uh, late spring, early summer. And uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. And, and uh, as we heard earlier, efforts like the, the Czech uh, Republic's uh, effort to try to get uh, shells, a million shells, and, and things like that will definitely make a difference. But we're now in a very 
difficult situation. But I, I think this is the interesting point. I know we've talked about it several times very much that there's that, uh, and as you rightly put it, is the kind of equipment that's needed is often very much delayed. It takes months and months for that to finally, uh, just with the air defense systems that have just recently been announced that the Alliance would now look for them if there's inventory. So it just seems that it's dragging on. So, but at the same time, you mentioned the Czech initiative. And I think also, I think the last 24 hours, we also have the Estonians who've come forward. I think their defense minister has said also they actually can find another million shells, putting it on. I think if that's true, that would be parity with the Russian ability. So, it, and, and you rightly so criticize the Europeans for just, you know, running in circles here. And that begs and the, the question. And the United States. <laughs> and the United States. But I mean, at the same time, we have almost a two-speed Europe. We have the Estonians, the Czechs, the, the Baltic states, Poland mm -hmm. giving so much, whereas others like Germany, Italy, very, very slowly. So can we ever have that two-system change, or are we just bogged down with this for, for good? You know, sadly, it may take an existential crisis. It may take the realization that Ukraine is going to go under. And I think that this helps to explain, for example, why France, all of a sudden, President Macron, uh, has begun to sound more hawkish, because it is sinking in, I think, that uh, Ukraine could collapse, or at least a, a part of Ukraine could collapse, and the Russians could be occupying a lot more territory than they were. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Germans are a very good example. You know, from, you know, two years ago, we already knew that Germany should provide Taurus missiles uh, to Ukraine, you know, the British provided the Storm Shadow um, and the French have provided the Scalps, but the German Taurus missiles are particularly effective. Many of Chancellor, uh, uh, the Chancellor's allies in Parliament are pushing him to give these missiles to Ukraine, but the Chancellor still is putting his foot down against it. So. In the end, sadly, I think it's going to be countries like Poland, the Baltics, I think the Finns, the Swedes, the Dutch, some of these countries, the British, uh, have a, a, a stronger awareness of how urgent this is, how you really cannot delay anymore. And, you know, Chancellor Schultz can, can, can throw his hands up uh, all he wants, but in the end, we're going to have to keep moving uh, as best as we can to save what is becoming a rapidly deteriorating situation. That's right. And unfortunately, very often it takes an existential crisis for um, countries to unite and do something about mm. it. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Alberto Cole, professor at thank DePaul you. University, was um, our guest tonight. Thank you.